Mayor Peterson Francis reveals that the cannabis movement and the Ayanula Council for the Advancement of Rastafari made a persuasive argument in their presentation on cannabis law reform. The local government official, who harbored concerns about the impact on social order and public health, was won over by a proposed strict regulatory policy framework spelled out in the pro-Gunja Group's plan. I have nothing against marijuana. I've never had, and as I said, I'm already, that is an area that I have grown up in. I mean, the, the young people, that doesn't mean because I have never used it. That doesn't mean that I'm against it. But after the discussion we had, which was a very good discussion, I mean, and what I like the, 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 the most about it is that they are very particularly particular about making sure that there are certain protocols you want to put in place, that it will not be a free-for-all. Now, I appreciate that very much, and I, I mean, that, that, that part of it impressed me immensely. Francis says his fears were laid by the focus on drug treatment and prevention, which include keeping marijuana out of the hands of children. They want to make sure that it's not something that will be, you believe that is free for all. So I appreciate it. As far as it comes to the health issue, they are concerned about it, about making sure that children and so on. So, so it's not what I, I understood that they said I have a change of heart. I mean, nothing about I have a change of heart, but I did not have the, what I was looking for. I did not have it before, but I said it was a very good discussion. And as I said, I'm very happy that they themselves want to see us, make, I mean, make it as strict as possible. To for, the, for the public out there. The mayor explains that he was not averse to cannabis per se, but skeptical about the capacity to educate, consult, and regulate, given the rhetoric does not often match policy outcomes. In St. Lucia, we always say the nice things before any what we want to do. Because let's, take, let's look at it. When you look at alcohol, okay? Right now you're saying, yes, that is, is people could drink alcohol. But how are we protecting our children from it? You, you realize some of the things that have been happening in the schools. You understand? The last time we heard, I mean, and we can't, we can't take these, like we heard they had some, I mean, children, they, 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 ex, they suspended from comprehensive as far as, you know, making kicks with if alcohol, if, I mean, marijuana, and so on. So these are the things that, you know, that I wanted to make sure that I have this safeguard. And as I said, the movement is extremely serious of seeing that that thing did not go haywire. Efforts to regulate and decriminalize cannabis have taken hold in many jurisdictions, but the drive is not new. In the CARICOM Crime and Security Strategy way back in 2013, the Caribbean Implementation Agency for Crime and Security Impacts noted, quote, A number of countries are questioning the wisdom of attempting to deal with drug problems primarily by prohibition, criminalization, and penalization of drug users, and are calling for a new focus on actions to reduce the harm caused to victims of drug-related crimes, drug users, and others. Progressive changes in drug policies in Brazil, Ecuador, the Netherlands, Peru, Portugal, Spain, Switzerland, and a number of states in the USA, including the states of Colorado and Washington, are evidence of this global shift. CARICOM cannot divorce itself from the international context and should undertake a serious review of counter-narcotics policies. Groups like the Cannabis Movement and ICAR, which have been at the forefront of drug policy reform, worry that given the paradigm shift, continued perceived dithering by local authorities in St. Lucia can leave the island out of step with a new dispensation. Winston Springer Jr., HTS News Force.